Amen. So Revelation chapter 8 is where we're going to begin tonight. So where are we at um, in Daniel's 70th week? We are just starting the last half or the second half of Daniel's 70th week. We're studying through the end times um, final seven years here and we're starting the second half. So we've gone through the first half of the week, which was basically the Antichrist, just to recap, if you've got the chart sitting in front of you, um, the Antichrist coming on the scene, making a covenant with many. Then we see, you know, this great war, the Antichrist rise to power, and that's the four seals, the four horses um, of Revelation chapter number six. And then, of course, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, persecution of Christians um, begins at that beginning of the week. And then, of course, the Antichrist um, begins to martyr um, Christians through his reign. And then we see um, towards the end of the week, the abomination of desolation, where the Antichrist, the Antichrist himself, now that he's consolidated world power, he desecrates the temple, declares himself to be God. And then in Revelation chapter 13, he declares that everybody must take a mark. We're going to look at this um, specifically tonight as well. He declares that everybody takes a mark and that they worship this image that he stands up in the temple. And then, of course, the Christians, the believers, do not take the mark. And that's what begins the Great Tribulation. And it, the Bible says that gets so bad that it's, it's, there's never been tribulation like that before since um, the beginning of time. And that just shows, you, shows us how bad it really is. And then, of course, God interrupts that Great Tribulation um, you know, a few weeks in with the rapture. All right, and the rapture is at that center of the week or towards the center of Daniel's 70th week. And then in Revelation chapter number 8, we see the beginning of the wrath of God. And that's what we're going to be studying for the next few weeks. Look at Revelation chapter 8 and verse number 1. Let's look at um, as the week continues here. And then he opened the seventh seal. There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. So now we're into the seals. This is the last seals. Remember we have these angels, these seven angels. The first um, part of the week was these seals, one through six. Right after the sixth seal was um, the rapture. The sun and moon were darkened. And then the seventh seal begins this silence, and it's kind of this break point between the tribulation and the wrath. I, I find it interesting that there's a silence in heaven, meaning you know, God wants to know that there's a separation, that what's about to happen is something different. We're shifting gears here, all right? And I saw thus seven angels, which stood before God. Unto them were given seven trumpets. So now, you know, we see this space of half an hour, this separation, and now they're given seven new things, which is seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And remember the saints in heaven, now, the, you know, now all the saints are in heaven, but even when the saints were in heaven watching the tribulation, they were asking God, how long? They were asking, how long are you going to let this go on, God, before you, know, you rapture them up? Now that's happened, and now the prayers of the saints um, are going to be answered because the wrath of God is coming upon the people that did such a terrible thing um, to the believers. And the smoke of the incense, verse 4, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. And the first angel, so now we see the first trumpet in verse 7, the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. So now turn to Revelation uh, chapter number 16. Now we need to understand that Revelation, and now you're going to see the real proof that Revelation is cut up into two parts, basically, that are parallel to each other, from Revelation 1 to chapter number 11, and then from Revelation 12 to chapter number 22. Because it is very clear, not so much in the first one, but it is kind of clear in the first one too, that the vials and the trumpets go together. That the first vial, the first trumpet announces the first vial, and the second trumpet announces the second vial, and so on and so forth. So that shows us, you know, kind of the, um, the chronological order of the chapters of Revelation. That's, a, that's a, one of the main proofs 
that shows us that. But if you look at verse um, number one of Revelation chapter 16, we'll see the first, actually go back to Revelation chapter 15, if you would. And let me just explain what the vials actually are. So we see the trumpets and the vials go together, but look at verse number one of Revelation 15, where the Bible says this, and it says, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels, so here's the same seven angels, having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So the trumpets and the vials go together, but the trumpet announces what's in the vial, and the vial contains the judgment or the wrath of God, all right? So anything that's actually happening to the earth is kind of that vial being poured out, all right? Now you may say that's symbolic or whatever, but I guess that's just kind of how I picture it anyway. But look at verse number, uh, look at verse number seven of Revelation 15, just a, another, another proof of what I just said. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. So it's the vials that contain the wrath of God. It's just the trumpet, the first trumpet announces the vial being poured out. The second trumpet announces the second vial, so on and so forth. Now look at Revelation chapter 16, verse number one, to see what's um, in the first vial. So we saw part of what's in the first vial in Revelation chapter eight, but now we get, it's kind of like the gospels. We get more detail of what's in that first vial in Revelation chapter 16 in verse number one. Look at verse number one. It says, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your way, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a no noisome and grievous sore upon all the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image. All right, so the first thing that we see is there's not like a lot of similarities between you know what we see in Revelation 8 on this first judgment and Revelation 16, but we do see that it's poured out upon the entire earth in this first judgment. But we see two different types of judgment upon the earth. And it's interesting because in Revelation 16 too, it points out the people that are judged in Revelation or in, in the first vial, all right? In, the, in Revelation 8, it says, hail and fire mingled with blood were cast upon the earth, and then a third part of the trees was burnt up, and a third part of the grass was burnt up. So the earth itself was, you know, damaged. A third part of the trees, a third part of the grass was burned up. But also we see extra detail in Revelation 16, 1, about certain people that are, you know, having wrath put upon them in Revelation 16. Now it's interesting because there's a specific group of people that are targeted here in Revelation 16, verse number one and verse number two. And many times we talk about the mark of the beast in the perspective of, you know, the tribulation, the great tribulation, that people that don't take the mark are not gonna be able to buy and sell. Go back to Revelation chapter 13. But rarely do we talk about the consequences of actually taking the mark. All right, so that's what I wanna talk about for the next few minutes. I kinda of wanna give you an accounting this evening of who's left on the earth at this point, all right? It's important that we kind of, you know, picture this in our minds. Look, we're not here for this. We're not here, we're not, you know, we're watching this from, you know, the private box in heaven, but it's important to understand because it, it plays into the millennial reign and how things are gonna work there. It's important to understand who's left on the earth at this point, all right? Look at Revelation 13 and verse number 14. Let's talk about the mark of the beast and, you know, look at it from the other perspective here this evening. Look at verse 14. It says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. This is the false prophet. He's got all sorts of powers to do miracles. Saying to them that dwell on the earth, this is before the rapture, remember, that they should make an image unto the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast. This is the abomination of desolation. That the image of the beast should both speak and caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So it's important to understand that when it says in verse 16, he causeth all, it means that he required all. Because obviously not everybody took the mark of the beast. So the believers did not take the mark of the beast. So when it says he causeth all, it means 
He compelled all, he forced all, he tried to make all take this mark and worship this image. And the consequences of not taking the image is what many Christians really focus on, obviously. It says that no man might buy or sell, save that he had that mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So we always apply that to ourselves, meaning, all right, obviously we're not taking the mark of the beast, so that means we're not going to be able to buy or sell. We're going to be, you know, marked and, you know, we're going to be hunted and, and all these things um, are going to happen. That's the great tribulation right there. So there's consequences for not taking it. We, we have always understood that. But what I want to talk about tonight is what about those who do take it? What about those who do take the mark of the beast? Because it applies in Revelation chapter 16 and verse number 2 where that first vial is poured out upon those who did take it, all right? So look, let's just do a quick accounting of who is still here at this point, all right? The rapture has happened. Who is left on the earth? Obviously, at the point of the rapture, the people that are left on the earth are unsaved, right? Because the saved, no mark, they're gone. They're raptured. They are gone. So there's a couple absolutes with the mark of the beast. The first absolute is that no saved person will take it. That's an absolute. All right, the Bible is very clear about that. But it doesn't say that every unsaved person will take it. That is not an absolute. All right, many people will just assume that, but that's not an absolute. The only absolute so far that I've told you that the Bible, and I've, I've preached on this before, is that no unsaved people will take it. All right, turn to Revelation chapter number 20. So the saved are gone, and they're not coming back until Revelation 20 in verse number 4, where the Bible says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, that the, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So at the end of the wrath, you know, the saved are going to come back and, and rule and reign with Jesus Christ in the millennial reign, all right? So that's Revelation chapter 20. All that are saved at this point, we're doing an accounting. We're doing an accounting of the moment right after the rapture on who is on the earth, all right? So the saved are gone. There's two types of unsaved people at this point. There's unsaved people. It's 100% unsaved people. It's unsaved people that have the mark and unsaved people that do not have the mark. All right, turn to Revelation chapter number 14. Turn to Revelation chapter number 14. Let me give you the second absolute when it comes to the mark of the beast. All right, look at Revelation chapter 14 and look at verse number 10. So let's talk about the unsaved people. I'm talking about like a second after the rapture because I believe that after the rapture, people are going to get saved like pretty much immediately at that point. I mean, Jesus has just come back. Like, say you were just on the fence about this Jesus thing, and you just saw Jesus come back. It's kind of like uh, maybe too late for that moment, but, I mean, a lot of people are going to get saved just from that event, in my opinion, all right? But look at verse number 10 of Revelation chapter 14. Now we're talking about people that have the mark, that did take the mark. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says this, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out, without mixture under the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. We're talking about eternal damnation here. All right, we're talking about hell, the lake of fire. Who? Who is this going to happen to? Who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So here's the second absolute. With the mark of the beast, there's only two absolutes. Number one, no saved person will take it. And number two, anybody that does take it is done. Anybody that takes the mark of the beast is at that point, it is too late for them. All right. So now there's two different ways to look at this. I guess if you turn to Revelation chapter number 19, I'll give you another proof of this. Revelation chapter 19 is kind of detailing the battle of Armageddon, this battle that is right after the wrath of God. So the wrath of God goes on for three and a half years. That's what we're going to study for the next few weeks. And there is still people that gather together to fight against God. 
There's still people that come together in a place called Armageddon. I believe it's uh, Revelation 16, where it calls out the name of that place and it's detailed in Revelation chapter 19. But just think about this for a second. We're going to go through all of these vials and all of these judgments upon these earth, these miraculous things that God is pouring out upon the earth and the people on the earth, and there is still going to be people that are just burred up and want to fight against God. Well, I mean, that just goes to show you what, that what I'm telling you is true. Look at verse 19. It says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies. Look, it's not like the beast and the kings. They have all these armies with them. The armies are made up of people gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, that's Jesus, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that he had received the mark of the beast, and, it, and them that had worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, and the sword proceeded out of his mouth, and the fowls were filled with their flesh. So look, what this is showing is that taking the mark equals being an enemy of God. So you could say it either way. You could say that only the enemies of God will take the mark, or you could say that, okay, people that took the mark, immediately they became reprobate at that point. Either way, you know, is, is true. But the point is, as we're taking account of who is left right after the rapture, there are only unsaved people at that moment. I believe people will get saved almost immediately start getting saved. But there's unsaved people that have the mark and that don't. So what does that tell you? If people that have the mark cannot get saved, people that don't have the mark can. So people that don't have the mark can get saved during the wrath of God. So what I'm trying to tell you, and actually turn to 2 Th Thessalonians chapter number 2. What I'm trying to tell you is that during the wrath of God, during these judgments that we're going to be talking about, people are going to be getting saved at that time. Amen. All right? Look at verse number 3 of, of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And I mean, that's a profound thing to say, and I'll, we'll, we'll see how that applies to us this evening in just a few minutes. But look at verse number 3 of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Now, what's the percentage of people that are going to be unsaved that take the mark and don't take the mark? You know, I, I don't know. Pick a number. You know, it probably will be the majority that take the mark. I, my thought would be because of this verse right here. It says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Meaning, the, the end times events are not going to start to happen until these things happen. Except they're coming, a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So this is the, the verse that we point to when people say that, oh, Jesus could come back imminently. He could come back tomorrow. It's like, no, these things can't happen until, you know, the main milestone here is that man of sin be re revealed, the son of perdition. That's the milestone. But there's this thing that we see before this saying a falling away first, meaning People at that time, I believe what that means is just that people at that time have just rejected faith. They've just rejected God. They've rejected the Bible. It's just the, you know, the Bible, the Word of God is on the downtrend. There's a great falling away, all right, when at this time when the Antichrist is revealed. So at that point, people will be, there will be a lot of people that are anti-God. There will be a lot of people that are anti bible anti-word of God. Look, every nation that has ever fallen in the Bible and throughout, you know, throughout history has gone through a falling away you know, of some kind. But there's going to be a falling away first. I mean, isn't that the pattern of nations? You know, they, they fall away, they turn their back on God, they do evil in the sight of the Lord, and then they're given over to the Philistines? I mean, isn't that you know, the pattern of nations? It's the pattern of our nation. It's what we're going through today. We're going through a falling away. But look, there's going to be a falling away before the Antichrist comes on the scene. So there's going to be a lot of people that take the mark. There's going to be a lot of people that are unsaved. There's going to be a lot of people that are anti-God. You know, but there's going to be unsaved people that won't take the mark. Now, just think about that. This isn't that hard to believe. If you just think about all the unsaved people that you know, that you meet out soul winning, whatever it is, I mean, just think about... You know, Pentecostals, they're not saved, but they know about the mark. 
they're probably not taking the mark <laughs> in, in, in my thought. But they're not saved. You think about, you know, repenting of your sins, Baptists. They know about the mark. They're probably not going to take the mark. I mean, just think, go through the list. Think of John MacArthur's church. Think of all the Lordship Salvation people, all the Calvinists who don't believe in eternal security, all these different, you know, false versions of Christianity that know what the mark is. They're probably going to be resistant to taking it. Maybe some of them will. But, I mean, there's a lot of people that are going to fight against it. A lot of, you know, religious type, Christian type people that aren't saved, that have a false gospel, are going to fight against it. In Matthew 24, 24, the Bible says, There shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So all, all that is saying is that no elect, no saved person will be deceived. All right? But mo and you could say that most unsaved people will be fooled, and maybe you could say a majority are going to take the mark, but look, not all, not all unsaved people are going to take the mark. I mean, just think about your libertarian freedom types. Forget, you know, the religious part of it. There's going to be people out there that are just like, uh, government's, not, government's not telling me what to install in my hand or my forehead or whatever it is. There's going to be a lot of people like that. I mean, a good, a good comparison to this was the whole, you know, vaccine mandate thing that came up over the last, I mean, there was a lot of people that, that objected for religious reasons, but there was a lot of people that just objected because they just, they didn't like, they didn't like the government telling them something. You know, they were worried about the safety of the thing. You know, they just had a brain that, that worked, basically. You know, they didn't have to be some, you know, look, I knew unsafe people that lost their jobs be, because they would not take the vaccine. And then I knew many unsaved people who were prepared to lose their jobs because they would not take it. So the only point I'm trying to make here, I'm not trying to bring up, you know, COVID controversy, but all I'm trying to say is that you don't have to be saved to, to push back against some of these types of things. And there will be people that are not saved, they're not religious at all, that push back against, you know, hey, in order to buy or sell, you got to put this chip in your head or, or in your hand. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to be like, uh, yeah, the government's spying on me and I don't want the government you know, spying on me and wrecking my brain with 5G or whatever their conspiracy is, but they're just not going to do it. And it has nothing to do with the Bible. It has nothing to do with you know, any kind of religiosity. All right? So it won't be just, you know, it won't be just people with the mark is the point. All right? So after the rapture, you've got 100% unsaved. Some with the mark, some with not. All right? Go back to Revelation chapter 16, if you would. I mean, for a minute or two, right? And then you're going to have people starting to get saved right away. I mean, this is the whole point. Actually, go back to Revelation chapter 14. Go back to Revelation chapter 14 and look at verse number 6. This is the whole point. I mean, if there was not, if there was not people during the wrath of God that were unsaved, that were able to get saved... What would be the point of sending the 144,000 with, look at verse number 6 of Revelation chapter 14. What does it say that they're given? The 144,000 are sent to the earth, and they're given what? They're given the everlasting gospel. They're given the gospel, they're to go and they're to witness to the people on the earth going through the wrath of God, going through these vials that we're talking about. So what? So they can get saved. So they can get saved, because not everybody took the mark. All right, now go to Revelation chapter 16. Go to Revelation chapter number 16. Go to Revelation chapter 16, look at verse number 2. So this is the interesting point that I want to bring up tonight, or one of the most interesting points that I think in this first vial, where Revelation chapter 16 gives us this extra detail, all right? So we've got the third part of the trees being burnt up, and a third part of the grass being burnt up after the first trumpet in Revelation chapter 8. But then in Revelation chapter 16, we've got wrath that is poured out upon men. All right? But not every man. As we've gone through this accounting, and now we know who's on the earth and who's not on the earth. We're gone. There's unsaved people, some with the mark, some without. Look at verse 2. It says, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore 
upon the men, what, all men? No, the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. If everybody had the mark at this point, it wouldn't even make any sense to say upon them which had the mark, first of all. So it's only that these boils, these sores, they are, they are put upon the people that have the mark, not the people that don't have the mark. Isn't that interesting? So the first point is this. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. The first point is this, and I've already kind of made it, but people are going to get saved during the wrath of God. That's the first point that we see here tonight. All right, look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Look at verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Look at verse number 1. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 says, When we then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that receive not the grace of God, that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in, thy, in a time accepted, in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So here's what you need to realize about salvation. All right? Salvation, and I know you're all saved in the church tonight, but look, salvation, the, the sooner it happens, the better it is for you. The sooner salvation happens for somebody, the better it is. This is true in your life, and this is especially true at this time. I mean, just think about just a normal person's life. Look, it's best... It's best that these kids, these little kids are being raised in a Bible-preaching church, uh, you know, a fundamental church that's teaching the truths of God, and they're going to get saved at a young age. That's the best thing. That's the best. As, for, as soon as, um, you know, as we looked at Romans 7 this morning, as soon as a child can understand the law and realize that they are guilty, you know, in light of the law, you know, they die to the law. It's, it's important that they understand the gospel. Because look, the gospel is so simple that by the time a child realizes that the law condemns them, they will be able to understand the gospel. There's no gap there. There's no gap where like the law convicts a child and then, you know, they have to wait for another five years to where they can understand the complexity of the gospel. Look, some Gospels are like that, right? Some false Gospels. They're so complicated, I mean, I, I can't even understand them myself. But the point is this. The point is this. The best time to get saved is as that young child. The best time. I mean, now, say you're an adult. When's the best time to get saved when you're 35 years old? Well, the best time to get saved when you're 35 years old is yesterday. It's kind of like, when should you plant a tree? Yesterday. The best time to get saved, the Bible is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the best time to get saved is now, is today. All right, so applying that to Daniel's 70th week and the wrath of God, people are going to get saved in the wrath of God, but it's not going to be a great time. It's not going to be wonderful for them. Look, the tribulation was not a good time. All that happened in the first half of the week was not a good half. Don't, don't forget, already a quarter of the earth has been killed already. Through the four horsemen, through that war where the Antichrist takes power, a quarter of the earth has already died in that war. All right? That is definitely some kind of massive nuclear war of some kind where billions of people have already died. But when the Christians are taken away in the rapture, that's it. They don't have to go through any of this stuff that we're going to see. But people are still going to get saved. It would have been better if they got saved before, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is saying, but they're still going to be able to get saved. Better. So if you're in the wrath of God and the vials start being poured out, when's the best time to get saved? Well, right there at that moment. That's the best decision that you can make. We can't go back in time. We can't go back and, you know, get saved before. I mean, the best time to get saved, the wrath is going to be terrible, but at least there's still a chance, is what I'm trying to show you. Turn to Psalm chapter 136. Psalm chapter 136. So we've got a third of the earth burning up, and we've got these grievous sores being put upon only the people that take the mark. Don't you think somebody's going to figure that out, by the way? Don't you think people are going to figure out don't you think that there's a reason that God is doing these specific things? So if there's all these people, just say there's a, there's a group of people in a family 
Say there's 20 people in a family that's not saved and they're all left over and, and you know, the cousins on the mom's side of the family, they all took the mark. And the other cousins on, you know, this side of the family, they didn't take the mark. And then all of a sudden, this, the, there's all these fires break out and the earth starts burning up and all the people that took the mark got boils and sores and these horrible conditions on themselves. And, and the other side of the family, just nothing happened to them. Don't you think that's a great proof of like, and they all like, they're all trying to like read through this and understand it. But somebody stumbles upon Revelation chapter 16 and they're like, huh. You see why God's doing this? God is doing this to help people understand that the Bible is true and turn people towards the truth. Even in his wrath. Isn't that something? That even in his wrath, and that's, that's my, the, the point of the whole sermon, that's my second point here tonight, is that even in God's wrath, he still has mercy. Even in his wrath, he is still doing things in a specific way to show mercy to those, hey, they weren't saved. They, they did not believe in Jesus Christ, but at least they didn't take the mark, and he's showing mercy to them here in the first vial and the first trumpet. Look at Psalm chapter 136 and verse number 1. Now this verse will probably make sense to you now that you see what God is going to be like all the way up to the end. Psalm chapter 136, verse number 1. The Bible says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. That's not just a saying to put on your fridge. That's what is true. His mercy endureth forever all the way to the end, even when he is pouring his wrath out upon the earth in the last three and a half years of this earth's existence before Jesus comes back and rules and reigns. Not to every person, not to every person, but for all time. It doesn't say for every person. In Psalm chapter 136, it doesn't say that God just shows endless mercy to every single person no matter what. That's not what that says. It says his mercy endureth forever. So in the wrath of God, if that wasn't true, God's wrath would just be poured out upon everybody that remained that was unsaved. He would have sent no one there to preach the gospel, and he just would have been like, this is just going to be punishment, period, for the next three and a half years for everybody. But no, that's not it. His mercy does endure forever, not for everyone, but forever. He pours out his wrath, and he singles out the reprobates from those who still have an opportunity to be saved. It's beautiful. It's amazing. I mean, the application for us in this first lesson is, is simple. It's just people think today, people think today that, oh, God, you know, I, I just, I, I, I'm no good. I, I've messed up too much. I, you know, even saved people think like this. I can't be any use to the kingdom of heaven on earth. I, I've just, I, I've, I've wrecked too many things. I've destroyed too many relationships. But people think that, you know, God cannot show mercy to them. People think that God cannot show mercy to somebody who maybe they've give the, given the gospel to several times. But what you need to understand, that God's mercy endureth forever. In his final judgment, the mercy is still there. In the final moments where God is clearly <laughs> pouring out wrath, anger, punishment, judgment, there's still mercy there. So for us to think that God cannot show mercy to someone that, that we know that's not saved, for example. I don't know how many times I've heard people ask me the question, well, you know, I gave the gospel to, you know, my brother or my aunt or my whoever, and they didn't accept it, and I've given it to them twice. Do you think they're a reprobate? Well, I don't know. God's mercy endureth forever. I hope not. I've heard several stories of people getting the gospel many, many times before accepting it and getting saved. I did not get saved the first time I heard the gospel. So God's mercy endureth forever. Just pray for God's mercy on that person. Beseech, beseech the Lord for that person. And for yourself personally, you need to understand that a lot of people would just get themselves into a mess. A lot of saved people would just get themselves into a mess. And they'll leave the Christian life. 
They'll do everything wrong. They'll mess up all their relationships. They'll mess everything up, and they'll just think, like, I'm done. God cannot use me. Well, you know, God's mercy endures forever, even at the, in the wrath. Just get right. Just get right and move forward. I mean, the mercy is still there. I mean, we need to never forget that God's mercy is always there for us. That's why Jesus is sitting there saying, you know, to the, to the saved people, he's like, hey, you know, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it in this Christian life. You're not going to make it as a disciple if you're constantly looking back. Amen. It's like you need to be looking forward because looking back is just going to stop you. He's like, it doesn't make any sense to look back. The mercy's still there. Get right and move on. Get right and move forward. Get right right now. The mercy is still there. So that's the most amazing thing that I wanted to point out to you this evening. It's a simple lesson tonight, but it's just as God begins to pour out his wrath, there's no saved people here at this moment after the rapture. He is still after lost souls, even as he begins the wrath. And that just shows us that we should also never forget to always be after lost souls. God never gives up on the lost. Look, he gives up on some people. But there is always going to be a mission all the way up to the millennial reign. There's always going to be a mission to seek and save the lost, even during the millennial reign. All right? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.